The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Rise! Get yourselves together! Rise! Stand up and live your life! Rise! Get yourselves together! Rise! Hands up! Hands up! Invent yourself, and then reinvent yourself. Don't swim in the same slough. Invent yourself, and then reinvent yourself. And stay out of the clutches of mediocrity. Invent yourself, and then reinvent yourself. Change your tone and shape so often that they can never categorize you. Reinvigorate yourself and accept what is, but only on the terms that you have invented and reinvented. Be self-taught and reinvent your life because you must. It is your life and its history and the present belong only to you. everybody to experience it for themselves but we don't want anything to do with mediocrity we want to keep reinventing ourselves and part of what Heidi and I do every week we try to give you really good ideas spiritually emotionally physically to get better but one of the things is is that you can't just watch the show you're not gonna get any better like that you have to put it into action you have to get in there and reinvent yourself every day it's your life and Part of what we do is entertaining, I would hope, but giving the information really doesn't do it for you. You really have to get out there and reinvent your life. You you have to, just like Charles Bukowski says. Well, you're almost forced to at certain times to reinvent your lives. I was just having Absolutely. this conversation about my daughter the other day, and I said, we have kids and we have expectations of our kids, and then all of a sudden, you know, as parents, because we think we own, we have ownership over our kids, they kind of crack it because they, they kind of go do their own thing. And then you said, well, the, the next 20 years of my life, I was planning to do this. And these are the sequence of the way things would have happened. You know, they would have done this, went to school, went to college, get married, have grandkids, mm -hmm. do whatever. And then, of course, your kids have to do their own thing. Have so then you say, way. okay, well, I guess my plan of what I was going to be doing for the next 20 years is going to shift. So now I have to find, you know, a, diff a little bit of a um, more meaning or some type of way to reinvent myself exactly the, the other thing that Charles Bukowski said in there he just said be self-taught which I think is amazing right like just you can get a little information from people but then you got to go out there and try it for yourself when I go to a gym I look at a gym as like part of the gym to me is a church number one because it's my spirituality and it can change me from the inside out but it, it's also a laboratory I'm going in there all the time trying to figure things out. And I'm not trying to figure out the equipment. I'm trying to figure out me and how I work and what can I do. So those are just some thoughts. And you have some information that we that you can help us physically today. I'm hoping. Because <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know what all this stuff is. Well, so. every week I decided to gather some information about nutrition or some type of thing to do with health to do on the show. Last week we talked about flaxseed oil and the benefits of it. And... I did do some research on the pregnancy part of it because I said that they don't recommend that pregnant women use flaxseed and it's something to do with ALA -AL that's in it. Either way, there's no proof either way that it causes a problem or anything with the pregnancy, but because they don't know enough right now about flaxseed, they're just telling pregnant women, we prefer you don't use it. Okay. But it's there's no proof one way or the other that it causes anything damage to the fetus. And then I wanted to follow up today with the difference between, because one of the questions I had from last week's show was, what's the difference between flaxseed and fish oils and MCT oil? 
And I said, I don't know. So I will find that out myself. So uh, the main difference is, is their potency and how they work with the body. Hmm. Um, MCT oil is basically found in coconut oil. And it's also found in whole milk full, and full fat yogurt and butter from grass fed cows. Hmm. And it's a very small molecule so that when it goes into our body, it goes right to our liver and it helps with your metabolism, digestion of food. And it's also people that are on a low fat or low carbohydrate diet, it helps uh, refeed the body in that way too. But I wanted to find my notes because there was some, I wanted to read this. They're good and uh, they reduce the, the risk of low fat diets and they're supportive of your gut environment because they combat bacteria in your system. So MT oil, MCT oil is probably the super um, oil of the, um, the fish oils and the um, flaxseed. Flaxseed is the lowest potency of where you're gonna get your oh, omegas okay. from. So if you're looking for a higher source, omegas, your fish oils are gonna be the way to go because they're more potent than they, re they uh, compare it to an athlete like you've got the top basketball players they would be the fish oils and then you've got the basketball player that's starting out they would be the <laughs> flaxseed and then of course you've got the MCT oil which would be your Michael Jordan okay and it's it's basically how the body is able to digest it and convert it for energy um, MCT oil and uh, fish oils help burn fat also so that's where it helps with the metabolism hmm. is it expensive um, MCT oil, you can go, um, I'm going to advertise for somebody right now. Um, you can go to <laughs> CrichtonNutrition.com and they sell MCT oil and it's about 40, $45 a bottle. Um, your fish oils are going to be probably for a bottle of good fish oils, which should be stored in the refrigerator or not on the top of your microwave, but in the refrigerator or in a, a closed you know, cabinet area away from sunlight so they maintain their potency. And usually, if you buy the fish oils in the refrigeration section, you're looking at anywhere from forty to sixty dollars for a sixty count um, fish oil. And of course, they have them where they're a little more reasonable. You know, fifteen dollars a, a bottle. I still haven't figured out personally if there's that much of a difference between the real expensive one and the one that's not. You can also get them where they're uh, citrus flavored, so that if you a lot of times people will say, I, I don't want to take fish oils because I, when I burp, all I can taste is fish. So yeah, one of the ways of, you can get rid of that <laughs> is true. one way is if you refrigerate them or the freezer and you take them that way, that'll get rid of that fishy um, taste that you get when you burp. And they also have them now where they're citrus flavored. So when you eat them, they almost taste like they have a citrusy um, taste to them. Mm. And the flaxseed oil is comes in different forms. It comes in um, whole seed, it comes in meal, and it comes in an oil also. And you can put the flaxseed right on top of your food. You can mix it in yogurts. Um, you can put it in smoothies if you wanted to. The MCT oil is used the same way. Uh, they don't recommend that you cook with the MCT oil because you break down the molecules. That's recommended that you take it either orally, a tablespoon as a serving, or you throw it in a protein shake. Or again, you can use it like as a salad dressing over your salad. I don't think it has any taste though, at least for me. Maybe the taste is just not that strong, but well, there, it, it, to me, it, it has kind of a weird taste. I love the taste of coconut oil. Coconut oil tastes kind of buttery. So if you're not a butter eater, mm -hmm. when you cook with coconut oil, it kind of gives your food a, a buttery taste. And there's another form. There's another way that you can get your MCT oils if you can't, if you're using MCT oil for a lot of people in your family and it's an expense thing, you can go to the coconut oil or the coconut, it comes in a, it's condensed and it's hardened and it kind of will dissolve if it's left in a warm place you can uh, get your MCTs from coconut oil also. Hmm. And it's a little bit more affordable. All right. And now one more thing, because I think most people think, when you think about uh, cardiovascular disease, we think about it's caused by fats. Mm -hmm. It's not. So but you're not saying that. It's ca <laughs> caused, they found over the years in studies that for years we were told that fats cause heart disease. Now there's bad fats too. There's a, the polysaturated, and the bad fats that you get from fast food a lot of times, those are not good in your body because they store fat. They're not gonna do anything for your metabolism other than it's gonna, it's not healthy for you mm -hmm. that way. They found that sugar, as it breaks down in our body, it gets stored as fat. 
and that's what causes heart disease because it hardens it, it puts like a calcification in your valves and around the heart and that's what causes the hardening of the arteries is the way the sugar breaks down in our bodies as fat and it gets stored right. and when I talk to my clients about this all the time one of the things that people don't get is they'll say well they you know with alcohol they say this all the time alcohol is not that's not fattening is it well <laughs> no if you think about it in in a, in a way it's not fattening but it's the way our bodies break down the alcohol at a cellular level and how it goes through our liver and then how our body starts to store it so when you drink alcohol it's like drinking sugar when it's all done processing mm. so if you're trying to lose weight i don't care if it says low alcohol low you know whatever they say um half the calorie beer you know whatever it is it doesn't matter it's like when you eat half calorie food you're eating chemicals uh you're still there they're gonna up the if they lower the fat in something they're up they're upping the sugar so you're getting twice the amount of sugar that you'd get is if you just eat something just eat it don't be going for the half this and the low that um yeah, why don't you drink your calories it doesn't fill you up well, I, people drink because they like the way it feels. You know, yeah. to chill, it relaxes you. And a good glass of wine is good with food. You know, you get a nice Italian dinner and a mm -hmm. glass of red wine, it, it complements each other. Uh, I just want to read enough. this really quick about the MCT yeah. oils because uh, a lot of people haven't heard of it. And again, it's coconut oil. And then if you want to raise it up a little bit level-wise, the MCT oil is distilled and it's it's processed a little bit differently for a better potency so that our body can absorb it faster than the coconut oil. But the coconut oil coconut oil has the same benefits you're gonna get the same and what it does is it helps you maintain your weight and so they make you feel full it specifically reduces stored body fat since it raises your metabolism you have more energy you think clearly you have better digestion it balances your hormone levels improves your mood it fights bacterial infection and viruses in your stomach and it also absorbs fat it has absorbing fat soluble nutrients from various foods so the other foods that you're eating, it helps your body absorb that also. All right. I don't have any more to say about that. You have, <laughs> you've gotten all the information on this. Well, because everybody gets so bogged down with everything, they don't know what's good. But if flax seed oil is, is flax seed oil and the seed is really good. The fish oils are very good for you. But then there's the what's the best? And the best would be the MCT, the middle of the road obviously would be your fish oils which right. everybody should be taking those because they're good for your skin and your hair also and flax joints seed too, I and your joints and, and, it, and it helps with inflammation that's the other thing that the fish oils do they don't make mention of that in the MCT oil about inflammation but I know for um, the flax seed and the fish oils it helps with inflammation so if you have arthritis um, people that train you know people don't realize when they train and we work out anytime you put your body under stress it doesn't have to be stress that oh my god I'm stressing out because I'm so busy anytime you you lift weights you do anything physical you're stressing your body so you need to put back you need to be kind to your body and feed it perfect and that's it that's all I got I like that I, I'm using I mean, that too by the way now I did order that yeah. because when I went on this diet <laughs> Joe has has me on this uh, what do they call it? What do you call it? Like a ketogenic type diet, or is it like a well, just low, low carbohydrates? No carbs. So protein and vegetables. It's high vegetables, which you're still getting your carbs. So I have to make that clear because my language when I first went on it, I kept saying to Joe, "But I have no carbs. Like my carbs are whatever." And he'd say, "Yes, you are. You're getting them from your vegetables." So it's changing your mindset around that. Instead of getting 26 grams of carbs from a cup of rice, I can get 26 grams of carbs from vegetables and get the same but not have the the cravings that you get when you have the exactly. stored um, starches you lean out faster and then of course we were trying to figure out ways or I was trying to figure out ways to to get the oil or get some type of energy source in my body so that's when you know I started reading up on the MCT oils I talked to a couple of other people and basically said because it's a healthy fat it helps It'll help your metabolism, it'll burn fat, and you won't store. But again, I want to make it clear, too, that the portions, whatever they say on the bottle for the directions of serving sizes, more is not better. People get this thing that, oh, They're my God, calories. burns fat. I'm going to drink the whole bottle. No, you're still taking fat calories, whether they're good or not. They're, it's still calorie caloric intake, so you have to consider that. So if it says one tablespoon serving twice a day, that's it. It's not six or eight a day, and you're going to be skinny because it doesn't work that way. So it doesn't. I've had people do that where they've actually thought that it would um, 
that that's what happened and they kept right. gaining weight and gaining weight and couldn't figure out yeah, why it's moderation and then when they tell you what they're doing you're like okay well they, you, that's you can't do that so anyway that's my thing on on that next week i'm not sure what i'm going to talk about next week but i i just think of these things during the week or somebody will Perfect. ask me something and yeah. sometimes i have an answer and sometimes i don't and i was curious too because i'm like but we we have flaxseed in the house mm -hmm. we were taking the fish oils which i will get the, us back on them because of the inflammatory part of it that's not covered in mct oils mm -hmm. so you know that could be another fact too i don't know i have to look it up all right I'll guys to we that. need to make sure my triple bacon buttery jack so made the with next part of the show i was thinking about you know what am i going to do this week uh, valentine's day was uh, two days ago now and I see all these Valentine's Day shows, and I actually listen to a few, and uh, Heidi sent me two, and I'm, I'm listening to these, and some of them, by the way, on YouTube will have like half a million views already. And I thought, well, that must be good. Then I look at it, and I listen, it, it just bores me to tears. I mean, they just say the same things over and over. And so I was thinking, I, I'm not gonna just do that again. You know, the, the basic, well, Valentine's Day should be every day, you know, and they, they, they say these platitudes, very superficial, doesn't really help much, it's all things that we already know, but we're not doing, and it, again, very superficial, so I thought, okay, this is really what I want to do, because when I was about 12 years old, if you can believe this, in New York, I used to listen to a WNEW, and I used to love this lady, the night bird, mm -hmm. and she would do these. John's looking at me. Yes, he's the one person in my life who knows who that is. Allison Steele. That's her real name. She's not with us anymore. But when I was a kid, I used to hear her voice overnights, and she had that great voice. Like mm -hmm. even I don't know if she could sing, but her talking voice was even better than Stevie Nicks. It was just so perfect. And in between playing these long versions of like the Moody Blues, uh, you know, she would play Inagata de Vida, 17 minute version, Iron Butterfly. You're still shaking your head, yes, you know I'm not lying. But in between, she would do poems. And one poem that she read was, I don't know, I was 12, but it, maybe it was the way she said it <laughs> that made me really interested. And later on down the road, I started looking at it, then I had heard that this poem was used through like through the 70s around that you know towards the end of the hippie era very much used in like a lot of weddings and it was Ooh. a different mindset back then so i looked over the poem and i thought it's so incredibly insightful there's so much stuff in it it's not your basic superficial stuff that we see today about roses are red violets are blue you know everybody loves you everybody like poop and so do you. <laughs> it's you know here's some candy for Jeez, you yeah or the jewelry this yeah is, jewelry. this is like the biggest <laughs> they say this this holiday valentine's day for the retailers is the even over christmas and everything for flowers chocolate and jewelry yeah and you know but uh, and a lot of it's out of guilt too right i mean people aren't doing it because they want to some people are don't get me wrong well, you got me this ring a couple of years but you didn't get me out of guilt no i, I didn't but you know what i'm saying it's kind of like that hallmark holiday yeah and what i love about this poem is that there's so much psychology in it that if you read it straight through it will be a poem that you hate because a lot of people will say, will read it and they'll say, that's not true, that's not love, that's not care, mm -hmm. that's not a relationship I'm in or I want to be in. And it's because the way he states it is, is that this relationship is going to take some work. And you are going to have to be a better person in order to get more love in your life. And you're going to have to be a better person to be able to give more love to people. Mm -hmm. People don't want to hear that. And so it, it's, it's an amazing poem. The guy who wrote it, his name is uh, Walter Rinder, and he's still alive. He's in his 80s now. And yes, I did try to get in touch with him on Facebook, and that didn't work. <laughs> Darn it. You should have told me I would have tried to. <laughs> so I'm going to have to set you up on that one. That program. one, I'll set that up on that one. For some reason, he gets offended because he'll go, they call you back, they always answer you, but they never answer me. I said, that's where the gender thing comes in. I'm sorry. Right. But that's like, you know, I hate to say, hate to say it, but I um, We're going to talk. <laughs> so what I kind of wanted to do today, because it's still very un-Valentine's like when you hear this poem, I'm going to try to read it, and I'm not as good as Alison Steele. I'll tell you that right now. But I'm going to try to read it straight through. Mm -hmm. And then what I would like to do is take it 
by piece by piece and analyze it in terms of what he's at least what I feel he's saying and mm -hmm. you could throw in stuff too about what you think he's saying and we could even John can throw in because this is not your normal love poem I'm saying but I love the way he starts it off just in case you're not sure he makes a declaration right off at the top of the poem and then we'll we'll go over this we good with that mm -hmm. okay two thumbs up this is called the spectrum of love I love you there is a much greater motivation than simply my spoken words for me to love is to commit myself freely and without reservation I am sincerely interested in your happiness and well-being whatever your needs are I will try to fulfill them and will bend in my values depending on the importance of your needs if you are lonely and need me I will be there if in that loneliness you need to talk then I will listen if you need to listen then I will talk if you need the strength of human touch I will touch you if you need to be held I will hold you I will lie naked in body with you if that be your need if you need fulfillment of the flesh I will give you that also but only through my love I will try to be constant with you so that you will understand the core of my personality and from that understanding you can gain strength and security that I am acting as me. I may falter with my moods. I may project at times a strangeness that is alien to you, which may bewilder or frighten you. There will be times when you question my motives. But because people are never constant and are as changeable as the seasons, I will try to build up within you a faith in my fundamental attitude and show you that my inconsistency is only for the moment and not a lasting part of me. I will show you love now, each and every day, for each day is a lifetime. Every day we live, we learn how to love. I will not defer my love nor neglect it, for if I wait until tomorrow, tomorrow never comes. It is a cloud in the sky passing by, and they always do, you know. If I give you kindness and understanding, then I will receive your faith. If I give you hate and dishonesty, I will receive your distrust. If I give fear and I am afraid, you will become afraid and fear me. I will give to you what I need to receive. To what degree or amount that I give love is determined by my own capability my capability is determined by the environment of my past experiences and my understanding of love of truth and God my understanding is determined by my parents friends places I have lived and been all experiences that have been fed into my mind from living I will give you as much love as I can if you will show me how to give you more, then I will be able to give you more. I can only give you as much as you need to receive or allow me to give. If you receive all I can give, then my love is endless and fulfilled. If you receive only a portion or a part of my love, then I will give others the balance that I am capable of giving. I must give all that I have, being what I am. I have loved a boy, a girl, my parents. I love art, nature, children, and myself, but only to the depth that I know myself. All feelings in life I find beautiful. No human being or society has the right to condemn any kind of love I feel or my way of expressing it if I am sincere sincerity being the honest realization of myself and there is no hurt or pain intentionally involved in my life or any life my life touches I want to become a truly loving spirit let my words 
if I must speak, become a restoration of your soul. But when speech is silent, does one project the great depth of their sensitivity? When I touch you, or kiss you, or hold you, I am saying a thousand words. Walter Rinder. Okay, that there is a lot in there. <laughs> that goes deeper than psychology 101. <laughs> it, it, there's parts in there that are going to confuse people. He even semi talks about what we today would talk about cheating in a sense. In other words, if you're giving love to somebody and they reject part of it as a human being, I'm not jailed. I should be able to give others my love. And that doesn't necessarily mean sex with other people. It just means that if you love art, if you love music, if you love to write, to do things, the people that are with you should magnify who you are as a human being, not detract from who you are. And there's a lot of people today when we talk about love and connection and this, what happens is that we love people as a, uh, there's a dependence on another mm -hmm. human being and it becomes two half people trying to become one and they don't fulfill each other. So we come into a relationship expecting that the other person is going to make us feel good. Mm -hmm. And that almost never works. So we blame the other person because we do not have the tools that we need to self-soothe or make us feel good. Mm -hmm. So I love all of that stuff. So tell me what you think and then we can kind of go through this a little bit word for word because that's kind of what I had planned today because it to me it's well, like the most amazing in there. He piece touches of writing. on trust, he, he you know, communication, mm -hmm. understanding. I mean, all of the things that, you know, we're told in a relationship that you need to have those fundamentals, respect, understanding, trust, love, listening. You know, we, I had this conversation with somebody yesterday about that, and I said, I'm guilty of this. See, I can admit when I, and I ha you have to, you have to kind of look at yourself and be able to say, this is where I fall short. I said to this person, at times I find myself listening to answer. Like if somebody's saying mm -hmm. something to you, instead of just listening, and you're really listening intently to what that person is saying, no judgments, no whatever, and then you can come up with some kind of answer, or maybe you don't have an answer, maybe sometimes you're just kind of, okay, I'm just listening, but I don't really have anything to comment about. But many times we listen with, the, that's not true. You're already in your head, either taking it upon mm -hmm. yourself that you have guilt about something or whatever. And I said, so that's one of the things that, you know, I told this client of mine that I need to work on for me is my listening to listen, not listening to answer. So, and I know that about myself. And the other interesting thing that when I told this person about my, something about myself, she said, I never knew that about you. <laughs> and she says, does Joe know that? And I said, I have no idea because I don't think I've ever told him. <laughs> and I, so now I'm, I'm, I'm sure one of, the, no, one of the things was an art gallery in my lifetime before I die, I am going to go to some I want to go to some art gallery. I don't care where the hell it is, but I want to be able to stand in front of real art and just not even know what I'm looking at and have to guess at the colors and my own interpretation of what mm. I see in a painting. I love art. I always have. So that was one of my things I said before I die. That's what I want to do. If it's awesome. New York, if it's here, I, I don't even know if there's anything here in Vegas that you could go see, but I legitimately want to go stand in a real art museum and just... Well, that can happen. That's, you know, take it all yeah. in. But that was the thing he says in there about yeah. listening. You know, you I, have to listen. And you know, it, it's it's amazing. I've been going over this poem over and over too for this show. Although it's, as you know, we we've actually done this poem on our on our music show. Mm -hmm. we, we we read it and we probably read it like two o'clock in the morning. I don't even know if anybody heard it, but we didn't analyze it for sure. And one of the things that you're saying right here to me is an amazing thing. Like you said, you want to sit back, right, and you want to see art. Right, and in this picture, there that you can't really see, but it's the uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, you know. And the part of it is, is when you are entranced by beauty, whether it be a human being or whatever it is, you don't judge it. You see it for what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what you said. Like, um, oh, and by the way, later on we'll be playing a video, and it seems like it doesn't connect, but it does to me. There's this dog that can barely walk. 
and it almost makes you want to cry when you look at it and you go what and then you know you just want to just hold it and mm -hmm. love this dog it, you can know that it will never get better that's part of what the video is but yet you love it anyway and it's so interesting like we can spend our lives with certain people and yet we just sit there and judge all day long mm -hmm. like in truth like why do we not do that like we can sit and have unconditional love and caring for objects for art for animals but when it comes to a person that is in our life giving us everything they have every day we can look at that person and we only see the faults mm -hmm. after the first two or three years we pass that honeymoon stage right we're always like yeah. oh this person's late this person's this this person should have said this to mm -hmm. me we're in our relationship together and yet, even though you're 50% of the relationship, usually, and I've never heard anybody say anything different, you know, in, in that I've done therapy with, they never come in and go, uh, Mr. Peroni, I could be a better person for my wife. I never heard that. All I hear is, my wife's a jerk. She does this, she does that, and she needs to change. She needs to lose weight. She needs to gain weight. She needs to change her hair. She needs to say this to me. She needs to do that. And then I hear it from the women, too. Nobody comes in and takes responsibility. Everybody wants to blame outside. But again, when you see like the beauty of like the Golden Gate Bridge, you just sit there in awe. And it's the getting to know somebody. Like when you first meet somebody, like I thought about you and I the other day with this, because we go through our little ups and downs too. Um, people think that Joe and I have this perfect relationship. I've had people say that to me. You know, you're on Facebook and your pictures and you're in the gym and you're always this, that, and the other thing. And then there's people who don't even know we're together in the gym because he's working, I'm working, and we don't do all the huggy stuff around. And um, I forgot where I was going with that. I just totally. It's okay. You lose yourself in I the moment. I lost myself. That's all right. That, that <laughs> oh, I said reconnecting with somebody because when you're dating somebody, you'll listen to everything they say. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what the hell it is. It could be, Joe, look at the tips here. Aren't these amazing? And Joe would be like, that's beautiful. Did you do that? You know, that kind of thing. He would say something to me and I would be like, this guy's amazing. Like, I can't believe that he just said that to me. Or he just, he knows that he's so smart. As time goes on, it's exactly what you said. You stop seeing the beauty in the person that you that you couldn't get enough out of. You couldn't find out enough about them. You couldn't have a uh, more of a conversation. You couldn't wait to be with them to talk about your day. Mm -hmm. You know, let's share our day. Let's share whatever. And I think in relationships, it's it's. I think life gets so much in the way a lot of times. The everyday stressors and our jobs, and that's an excuse, by the way. Mm -hmm. But it it does. And I think if people could just try to reconnect and as people change you know like when you started getting into counseling and stuff it was difficult for me and it still is it is still difficult because the guy I met was a trainer and he had lost his wife and he was going through a really tender part of his life where he was very vulnerable and he needed somebody to be there and I was that person and then as he went on to school and you wrote your book and he got stronger and he got more secure and he was actually starting to be the man that he's supposed to be because for years you were not doing, you were kind of living a family life doing, mm -hmm. you know, no the doubt. family thing. And that's, that's what was right at the time. That was what <laughs> you were supposed to be doing. But I don't think it was the person that you were, you were kind of fitting into the life that you chose at that time mm -hmm. I did the same thing for a while in my marriage you know you fit yourself in where you're supposed to be and then the person starts to, to go a different way and you're like that's not the person I met and I'm sure you could equally say that about me with when you first met me as a training client I mean I was overweight I was very quiet I was like shy I didn't want to be in the gym I was very insecure I I questioned every single thing I, I did in the gym outside the gym and as time went on, I got stronger. You be, we started a date. There was an attraction there. Mm -hmm. And now I can honestly say I've had people that have known me for like the last 11 years. They said, you're not the same person you were 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not because I seem like I am. And I know I've gotten changed a lot in my thoughts about a lot of things. And I've become a little bit stronger as far as my way I think about things. You know, I, I'm hearing you say this. And the thing that keeps spinning in my head right now is the way we've tied the very beginning of the show to about life really is about reinventing yourself like people don't reinvent themselves and that 
I think somebody told me this a long time ago, like most people, they're dead by the time they're like 18, 19, 20 years old. They just haven't been buried yet. You know, they're, they don't really progress. And I think when you have the courage to try harder, to do better, to take action, and to just flourish in who you are, just love your life, mm -hmm you will, just like Charles Bukowski said, you have to reinvent yourself to a point where someone will not recognize you later down right. the road. And that's the beauty of, of life, isn't it? But at the core of all of it, like at the core of that person, they're still the same person. They're still that little boy or that little girl. Mm -hmm. And that little, you know, I think about an apple core and as you peel it and you take all the layers off of it and it does this, inside that very core is that little girl, that little boy and whatever the heck happened when they were little and as they you know they grew you know the the peels come off you know and you start to reinvent yourself and mm -hmm. one of the things that somebody had said to me a long time ago was you for me a, a really good word I like to use and I really like this word is joy and I don't know why everybody says happiness all the time I want to be happy I want to be you know and for me my somebody it's you've said this too and I read a lot about it and it said what brings you joy and there's a difference between joy and happiness mm -hmm. and one of the things is is that when you're going into your counseling thing and you're you're into that and you're writing and you're analyzing and you're you're growing in that area there's a part that you know you almost feel like I have to grow with you in that way in that direction and the thing with the universe is that what it does is it it we all want to go in relationships. We want to maybe be the other person so that the relationship stays what we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. What happens though, the universe will interfere with that. And they say, there's a difference between being supportive of me saying to you, I'm supportive of your counseling. I think you're an awesome counselor. I'm supportive of your training. That's not me. Heidi, the person over here that's what brings me joy would be something different that you may look at and say, like for me, it's art. For me, I really, in my future, I'd like to, to really get into some art and be more creative that way. You may look at that and say, can you not take another bead class? Do I have to have all this shit around my house? All, I mean, I don't know. And, and I'm going to try to draw you into that. It's like if I tried to draw you into the cosmetology world and I said, Joe, you got to come over here and you got to check out these hairdos and all this kind of crap. There's a point of you that you would say to me, I really like that because you like it. It's not you, though. Right. As and the that's, same thing. And it doesn't have to be anything but more But you can than still that. be uh -huh. in a relationship and you can still, like the, the movie, the little insert in the beginning says, you have to reinvent yourself. But the, the thing that happens in a lot of relationships is that people are reinventing themselves and their partner is kind of, you got to give them a minute to catch up. They're not... You're not the same person, and yet you still love that person. There's still... Well, there's a lot of fear, you know, and... and yeah, and mm -hmm. change is difficult. But I think what you're getting at, which I think is a great thing, which kind of the, what the poem kind of says, mm -hmm. too, is that what... I mean, we could talk about this forever. What is true love? You know, one definition would be is to allow your partner to be who they need to be as they grow, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's part of it, is to get out of their their sunshine right so they can be who they're going to be it's like i will never let's say, i'll name someone who's i can never play guitar like eric clapton okay mm -hmm. but i'll be in front <laughs> row <laughs> but i'll be in front row and i'll <laughs> clap and cheer you try hard <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> obviously not but the thing is though if i knew eric clapton i wouldn't stop him from playing and say listen mm -hmm. man you can play way too good and you're really making me feel bad i would i'm in front row and if somebody else who doesn't know anything about bodybuilding, and you know I've done this, I bought out the first three rows of Cashman Center. Mm -hmm. of, and I would say two and a half rows of people who have never seen a bodybuilding show before because I was going to entertain them to make them see what there is to like about bodybuilding mm -hmm. as John yawns. But I'm telling you, you would have liked it. <laughs> and that's the point. I don't have to have friends who are mm -hmm. bodybuilding friends. I, but if somebody tried to stop me, from doing my bodybuilding, hmm, there's no relationship there. I can't be with someone who's trying to shut me down. Just as a quick example, I can do this. But right. I think okay. the understanding, not to interrupt you, but I think the understanding goes the other way too, that you have to be okay. The person that's doing their thing has to be okay with the other person not being into it because that causes conflict too because mm -hmm. what happens is we say, well, he may not be into art, 
he might say, I'm not really into this, but I'm going to go because it's something she's okay. And then if he gets mad at me or whatever it is, because I like it, we, then we think that we have to be with somebody that likes exactly what we like. So that's where some problems come into relationships too, because they'll say, well, you don't support me. It doesn't mean that you're not supporting somebody because you're not really into what they're doing. It means that you're supporting them enough to say, okay, you do your thing over here and you let me do my thing over here. You don't have to love what I'm doing every minute, just like I don't love what you're mm -hmm. doing, but I'm going to support you where I'm not going to get in your way. And I hear this a lot with couples that say, we don't, we don't have anything in common anymore because he likes this and I don't like that. Well, you don't have to like football. And this is a big one with women. No, you don't have to like football, but you can once in a while sit down and enjoy a game with him because there's going to be things that you do that he doesn't like. Like when he took me to Cinderella that time to see the ballet, he hates the ballet. He does that. I could tell. He was like, I'm dying. But because I liked it, he said, you know why? Because you loved it, I loved it. And it was a Black Sabbath show that night. And a Black too. Sabbath he missed to go take me to Cinderella. God, I know. And I didn't know that until after. And I felt I started to feel bad. And then I went, I don't feel bad because I got he took me to see Cinderella. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't have to be exactly like our partner either. Because you hear that all the time too. Well, we have to end the relationship because all of a sudden he went from trainer to counselor. And I'm going from hairdresser counselor to some art freak <laughs> you know down on but, free my, my my abstract art but not to be know. mean right but there there's an we need to be enlightened right mm -hmm. we need to grow a little bit as we reinvent and part of the reinvention is there's a commonality right mm -hmm. like okay donnie marie right i like you can like i can like rock and roll you can like country whatever yeah. but the middle ground is this you like it's, music it's right that's a good one um my middle ground that i would even say just let's say it's like music compared to I don't know whatever something else you would might like the middle ground is not any of that the middle ground is the other person's happiness you know are you happy does it make you smile because then when you're in the relationship and you're happy then I'm happy that's really the bottom line isn't mm -hmm. it like if somebody does something they say listen I'd really like to work out it makes me happy why would somebody shut that down like it makes no sense it would be an insecurity on, on mm -hmm. their side well, I think women in general, and you know this because you work with women. I know this because I am one, and I work with women in the salon. I work with women now with wellness coaching. Women go through most of their lives not knowing who the heck they are. Mm. There's an identity thing. What do you call that? Self-actualization. Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah. I have a whole show what happens, already written about that. <laughs> you know, you'll sit down. And I'll say to these women, "What do you like?" And I've had this question asked to me, and I'm still trying to answer it. I mean, it's, it's and it's so frustrating to me because I have an answer for everything usually, but to look at myself. And, and not be able to answer that question is so frustrating to me. And I think I'm 51 years old and I still can't answer that question. I'm gonna, well, in another show, I'm going to tell you But why. we'll talk about it. But okay, let, let me do a quick but little man, demonstration. But they, they kind of know what they're doing right away. Like, There's a reason for from that. From day one. They already... Society like, forces it. <laughs> you know. But let me do a little, quick little demonstration. Then we hopefully get it. Okay, maybe believe this, the microphone right here is a, like a tree, right? A tree. So what happens is the sun's shining down on this tree. The tree is good, right? Yeah. Now over here we have a bush. Now, if it's too close to the tree, there's no sunshine, it doesn't grow. Mm -mm. So it's gonna die. So what we do is, if we're planting this strategically, this garden, we slide this plant or bush, or maybe it's a tree, who knows? It, did, it didn't have any sun, <laughs> it's not gonna grow. So if we slide it over mm -hmm. here a little bit more, they both can get sun and they will both will grow. Mm -hmm. Now, part of what you're talking about is, let's say we have this tree that's really growing well, and then we go, okay, you're in this the shade, you're not growing well. We put you over here. If this was a human and mm -hmm. it hasn't figured out what it wants to be yet, a bush or plant or a tree, <laughs> <laughs> and it's scared to death, this is, this is gonna be like growing pains mm -hmm. here for a while. But really that's what needs to happen mm -hmm. in order for a good relationship to happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I, let me go over this poem a little bit more. Mm -hmm. so, Cause it seems ambiguous a little bit as you go through the poem. But I love the way he puts the declaration right up front. First three words. I love you. Mm -hmm. Boom. Just says it right there. Just in case you were thinking anything else and it's not a love poem. I love you. Period. There's nothing more you really need to know than that. You want to know some details? Then he goes into details. And it's really interesting how he says there's a much greater motivation than simply my spoken words. Because in the United States, especially with capitalism, we want to buy candy, we want to buy jewelry, we want to buy whatever. It's about these little trinkets. It's, it's about money sometimes. It's like love is this feeling. Love is really not a feeling. Love is a word of action, which you do. 
specifically do for another human being's well-being. So if you wake up in the morning and you say, I wonder what my partner is going to do for me today to make me feel good, you're not a good partner. You're kind of a narcissistic, immature human being that might not be ready for a relationship. If you wake up in the morning and you say, how can I make my partner's life better today? Okay, now we're talking. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking mature love. Because we do that with our clients. Absolutely. You go in yes. the gym and you go, how can I make this client have results? How can I, or they come in and they're grumpy. And you go, how can I make this client smile? We do that all the time. We're, we're people pleasers. But when right. it comes into our relationships, you walk in the house and half the time you don't say hello. You, you're grumbly. You're, mm -hmm. you know, this and that. You would never walk up to a client and go, when the, if you said how, if they asked you how you were, and you said, I feel like shit. Like I had a terrible night. You know, <laughs> why are you asking me that? Yeah, it's like, could you imagine you walk like, in and you go, what do you need? <laughs> like, really? That's too much work. That's too much work. Like, you would never do that. So if you wake up in the morning and you just go, you know, how am I going to make my partner's life a little better today? That would solve 90% of the problems right there. And if you have a partner that's not saying that also, they need to be educated. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing. And if they're educated and they do not sit there and say, well, what can I do for you to make your day better? Well, then you're probably with the wrong person. You know, I don't want to be mean, but I mean, that's, so it needs to be mutual and it needs to be reciprocal. Mm -hmm. This other line I just love, he says, I am sincerely interested in your happiness and well-being. Think about that for a second. I'm interested in your happiness. I'm not responsible for it. Um, you cannot blame me because you had a bad day, and if you have a bad day, don't throw it on me. I'm definitely sincerely interested in your well-being. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to go out, smoke cigarettes, eat bad food, and act like a jerk to people, that's on you. <laughs> you know, I love the way he said Like, you will never in your life find a love poem that says, roses are red, violets are blue. I'm kind of interested in your happiness and well-being, but... If you don't want to help yourself, I'm oh, out. Wow. <laughs> like that's, I love that. And that is the essence of psychology right there is that you're responsible for your stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, your partner is not like the dancing clown mm -hmm. trying to get your attention and make you smile. That's not the way love works. The other part is, and he says in here, whatever your needs are, I will try to fulfill them. Very interesting. He says, and I will bend my values depending upon the importance of your needs. He didn't say I'm going to break my values and I'm going to become a whole different person. He said if your need is that important, I will compromise with you, I will collaborate with you, I will do the best I can to meet that need. But I am not breaking who I am as a person. He never said that. He said bend. Bend. Think about this. Very interesting. A guy who's one of the greatest poets ever. I'm pretty sure he sat on that word for a long time. It just mm -hmm. didn't appear. He, no. you know. Then he goes on. If you're lonely and need me, I'll be there. If you need to talk, I'll talk. If you need me to listen, I will listen. Do you see that part? That's amazing because you said that before. It's like when we're in a conversation with another person and we get a little let's say aggravated and it's something about us, we tend to sit there trying to build up a weapon mm -hmm. and we're waiting to sling that back. We're not listening to our partner. We're but, not watching right, their But beauty. here's the other thing, even in business, like uh, being behind the chair, I gotta tell you, this is like the most awkwardest thing. And I would be lying and every hairdresser out there, I don't know if you've ever had this happen as a personal trainer, but I have had a client tell me right I've asked them, what do you think about your hair? Do you like your hair? No, I don't. Hmm. That is like, that's a conversation that you're, you know, we're talking about inner yeah. relationships here, but you stand there and you, you can feel the, you go, oh, cause I thought I just did a really good job and whatever. And then you have to stand there and you have to listen and you can't project, you can't defend, you can't do anything. And you have to kind of be able to, to be able to be mature enough to say, okay, then how do we fix it? But, but listen to mm. what the client says because the first time you start interjecting and saying, well, I cut it the way you wanted it. 
they just clearly told me that they don't like their hair. So obviously, I didn't cut it the way they wanted, or maybe the color is not right. And I've had that happen over my career. I've been doing hair for 30 years, and it's like somebody kicks you in the face because you're always we're always expecting the person to be like, I love what you did, or the positive parts of things. So the listening part of it sometimes it's not always going to be, you know, you're amazing, and I think you're whatever. The listening part has to be where you're able to, you know, you can feel the lump in your throat or you can feel the little pain in your heart because nobody wants to hear that they're, they've hurt somebody or mm -hmm. that they're not whatever, but the listening part, what, what we just said. It's hard. You have it's to, hard to, to listen to do, but That's a transferable go. skill. Uh, you know, I can't believe he's saying this to me right now. You know, or my client. You know, that's happened to me a few times over my career. And But if you can do it, it work. It work. You can, you can do it out well over you the place. You out there, I mean. <laughs> if you can do it at work, you can do it. You always have to think about the consequence. If you don't, yeah. if you don't handle yourself at the workplace, what's going to happen? You're going to lose a client. If you don't handle yourself in your personal relationship too, over time, you're going to lose your relationship. So, mm. we have to can't take our relationships for granted, and the people that we're in a relationship that they're always going to be there to take our garbage. That's true. So. So let me try to run through this real quick. Keep me on time here. There's one, another part in here that says, no human being or society has the right to condemn any kind of love I feel or my way of expressing it. Now, Walter Rinder is gay, okay? So when he wrote this in 1970, you have to understand the American Psychology Association considered homosexuality to be a mental disability or a disease. Mm -hmm. And that's when, so that again, controversial. And like he would say, and of course he was ahead of his time in that area. There's a part in here where it says, if you can only receive a portion of my love, then I will give others the balance that I'm capable of giving. Mm -hmm. And the point there is, is that there's a fine line between somebody who has insecurities and hurt in their own life and they're trying to shut another human being down mm -hmm. compared to that almost being abuse where you tell somebody what they can say, what they can wear, who they can talk to, where they're, what time they need to come home, mm -hmm. keeping tracks on them of what they're doing, like this GPS thing on them all the time. People do need to love other people, mm -hmm. and people do need to converse and to talk and to do these things. And when you let people flourish, they tend to come home and be very happy. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's so many things in this poem I could talk about. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a lot of time, but one thing I thought of before when we were saying it is we don't treat each other and our partners with the respect that we treat outside mm -hmm. type of things such as uh, John and I before the show we were listening to the Beatles and we both agree like the old Beatles stuff is still great we still tap our feet it's still mm -hmm. amazing but the Beatles are not us Beatles are music but how come we, when we deal with our people that we supposedly love we after two or three years we find all the negatives in them Listen, I've been listening to the Beatles now for over 40 years, and I still don't find any negatives in them, right? I'm still saying that they're great. I love it. I still tap my feet. I still know all the words. And you know what? You ever talk to a partner, and it's like, you know what? I heard that story, and I heard that story, too. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear you talk anymore. Please, with that story. But let me go listen to the Beatles again for the 50th time of my life. I don't mind listening to them over and over again. So you could, we could all take that personally, right? Or how about how we don't root for our partners to do well in life? And yet, we can root for a football team. Even when they suck, like the Jets, and they never win a game. The last time they won, I was four years old. It was like 1969, they won the Super Bowl. I could still root for the Jets. Listen, there's people in my family that will be rooting for the Jets to win the Super Bowl much harder than they will ever root for me to win a bodybuilding show. Why is that? That's weird. And I don't mean it's a family thing. That's just the I way so. life is. Yeah. Um, do we have any I time think left? We're out of time. All right. Let, let's just say artwork for a second. You know how you look at artwork and you go, oh, look at that picture. See that? Mm -hmm. See all the things in that? I wonder what that artist was thinking. Think about this for a second. Look at my hands. You want to see artwork? I caught a touchdown pass when I was 14 years old. I caught that pass. This finger, after I caught it, was bent back over here. Mm -hmm. This finger over here, I got caught underneath somebody's shoulder pad. It was never fixed. You hear the crack? This one over here, I cut my finger off. Okay? You see that? Like, human beings, the people that we love, are living, breathing 
art for us if we have that mentality if we can sit there and truly love that person that we are with and really see them as the artwork as they are because trust me that person that you're living with or talking to or that you've loved that you have sex with or the they're actually much more important than the Beatles will ever be in your life, but you don't seem to understand that yet. So that's all I have to say. That's my very odd Valentine's Day show. What do you think? It's true. <laughs> so thanks for being with us today. This is the Rise Above Show. I am Joe Peroni. I'm Heidi Mancini. Well, you really never know because when people bring in animals, uh, they tell the story that they tell. The person said when she dropped Boogie off was that she found him in the Walmart parking lot. But um, at the shelter, you do get a lot of dogs that come from breeders and uh, backyard breeders, and, and they, they're embarrassed to say that that's where they're from. He was so little and his head was so big and he was so wobbly. I mean, and, and working at the shelter, you see a lot of dogs come in with a lot of different medical conditions. So we knew it was neurological. The med team cleaned him up and put him on foster watch, which means until we find out what's going on, let's send him to a foster home just in case something goes wrong. And so I took him home to foster him. A couple of days later, we went to the neurologist and they diagnosed him with cerebellar hypoplasia. He's very unsteady, so he can't climb up things. He can't jump up on the bed and he can't play fetch. If there's anything raised, stuff in the yard that's poking up, like he's gonna roll over. That's just what his body does. When we brought him home, he was just like a little peanut. The whole world revolves around him. He's the boss of our house, the literal boss of our house. But it didn't take long for us to realize we were gonna keep him. I, I fell in love with him right away though. So fostering is easy, and, and you're not supposed to keep your fosters either, but he won my husband over, so. But he is a special dog and he does take a little bit of special care, but it's totally worth it.